Welcome everyone to Comic-Con's At Home Music for Animation panel. I am Keith David and joining me as moderator today is my fellow actor, Alan Tudyk. Thank you, Keith. Hello, everybody. We are excited today to dive into some of the music behind some amazing animated shows. Let's get started. Okay, well, first up, he has scored amazing animated projects like The King of the Hill and J.J. Villard's Fairy Tales. Welcome composer, Roger Neal. Hey. Roger. Hey, thank you. Good to be here, hey. thank you. Hey. <laughs> we gotta wait for the crowd and Hall H to die down. This is Comic-Con, there's a lot of <laughs> fandom happening right now. <laughs> Everybody, come on, we gotta get through this. All right, next. They are the incredible music duo behind Disney Animation's Olaf's Frozen Adventure and Apple TV's Central Park, people. That's an amazing show. Love that Welcome show. Welcome songwriters, Elisa Samsel and Kate Anderson. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, next, he created the music for our favorite turtle teenagers in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on Nickelodeon. Welcome composer, Sebastian Evans. Oh my God, it's a oh. <laughs> <laughs> Next, Keith and I have both had the pleasure to work on the super cool, awesome Harley Quinn animated series for DC. Yay. Welcome, composer Jefferson Friedman. Hello. Oh, yeah. Happy to be here. And finally, he scored the music for Troll Hunters, Tales of Arcadia and orchestrated on films including Frozen 2. Welcome composer and orchestrator, Tim Davies. Yeah, hey, good to be here. In the house. All right, panelists, this is your first question. It's worth $25,000. <laughs> 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 Our first question to everyone. What is the most fun thing you love, wow, about creating music for animation? Oh, wow. Well, as you, yeah, there's so much that's fun about writing for animation. Um, I think for Elisa and I, it's that our brains have always kind of written in that kind of way of really, really big thinking and big dreams. And oftentimes our theater producers will call us and be like, hey, we can't have a dragon or we can't have like seagulls singing. And uh, <laughs> so that's why writing for animation has been a really good fit for us in a lot of ways because it's kind of like anything's possible and um, especially with Central Park we can write a song and then they take that and turn it into like a rap video or hip-hop kind of thing or a, or a flashback or just any kind of thing that uh, that the music is speaking to they'll take it and blow it up. Right and we come from theater so in theater you can only have so many actors and so many mm. costumes so on Central Park that big opening number that we start the series with mm. we really wanted to represent all the people that you would see in Central Park and Kate and I lived in New York City for a long time so we wanted to have the hot dog vendors singing, the halal truck um, owners singing, the people rowing boats singing, the people exercising singing. Um, and people selling mangoes and churros. And so we wanted them to all have a line of, of, of the song. And in animation, we get to do that. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, it, it's like the best way of letting your imagination run wild. Well, this next question is for Sebastian and Jefferson. Now, you both have worked on series featuring characters who have previously been depicted on screen. For Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Harley Quinn, did you look back at the previous approaches to the music? And how did you make it your own? Let's start with you, Jefferson. Uh, well, um, actually, since uh, I started working on Harley Quinn, I had a personal, um, uh, uh, I put the kibosh on watching anything DC. Up until that point, I'd probably watched basically everything DC. But um, as soon as we started the show, I self-imposed a moratorium on that just so that uh, my uh, uh, memory of those other scores would be more of like an abstraction of those kinds of sounds for those kinds of characters so that I could do something that was kind of um, in the tradition or uh, in the can sounds like it's part of the canon but was unique to myself. I didn't want any sort of literal 
DC music stuck in my head while I was writing. And Sebastian, how about you? Yeah, I actually, I guess you could say I kind of did the opposite. I'm like a, basically a fan doing a dream job of like, I wanted to sum up everything that was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that ever happened, but <laughs> add something that I thought was not there, which was the true ninja sound. Like it seems like in every single iteration, they leave out this ninja, you know, like, um, you know, ninja drums or ninja instrumentation or ninja um, vibe. I really wanted to insert that along with the hip hop vibe and kind of engulf like a, a basically um, everything that you ever heard about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles just crammed into this one homage to all things Ninja Turtles. Mm. <laughs> so no, <laughs> I watch everything. <laughs> I right. always think of ninjas as being completely silent. I'm glad <laughs> that you found the instruments to give them a beat. That's uh, right, because when they're doing that silent thing, they're probably listening to something that's got a ninja vibe, you know? That's how right. they walk like that. Right. You gotta you know? give them the headspace. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, Roger, uh, King of the Hill, one of yeah. my favorite animated shows. I do. Most well-known shows. It was on for an unprecedented 72 years long yeah. running um i scored every episode two years too that's <laughs> that's what i heard you're a god what uh what is a favorite moment if you can sift through it all what is a favorite moment from uh creating music on the show over those years well it's tough i mean we did we did in actuality 13 seasons so i can't quite do the math it's a lot um and the scores were done uh, with small orchestras, which is a real pleasure. You know, I just like to work, do a recording session every week with, with a group like that. Cool. But I'll tell you, I think I can answer your question this, this way, Alan, is that when it first started out, we didn't really know what the sound of the score is going to be like. It seemed, you know, it was in, the show was in Texas, so it seemed like guitar should be involved somehow. So um, that was pretty much all, all we knew. And I had this first episode early in the first season that kind of had a thriller vibe. Like we had to kind of like discover some mystery and there was some peril. And the way that um, the animators and writers had created this particular episode, uh, it seemed very Hitchcockian. Um, but I thought I was supposed to score the show with electric guitars because it just, you know, no one told me otherwise. I was just so, so I ended, ended up writing the score that was like, really, it sounded like um, Psycho, but with a, with a rock band, you know? Mm. And it was, it was fun as hell. And it was the only solution I could come up with, and it really worked out well. But then it's after that, we call, I think, the producers and us all decided, you know what, if you're going to make an orchestral score, let's just do an orchestra release from here on out. So, so it was after that, we changed, we changed the format. But that was, a, that was a way to solve a problem, and it was really fun. There you go. Something different. Um, Alisa and Kate, um, I know you guys said you, uh, you come from the theater, so I'm very interested in this. You are working with the hilarious Josh Gad on Central Park. Now, tell us how you got to be involved in the show and how you bring so much humor to its songs. Well, we first met Josh Gad on our first animation project, actually, which was Olaf's Frozen Adventure. Oh. And that's oh actually where we, gosh. yeah, we met Tim Davies that day, too, when we were recording the orchestra. He was our conductor. Um, oh. So we met. Josh on Olaf's Frozen Adventure, and he was the kindest, funniest human being we'd ever worked with. And we sort of sent a prayer out into the universe that we would get to work with him again. And then, Kate, what happened? Well, um, we were both living in Brooklyn and sort of hoping that something would come along magically. Working on theater, you're always kind of like, oh, okay, we've got like four years till this is gonna be anything. So um, Josh reached out on, of all places, Instagram and um, <laughs> was like, hey, can I talk to you guys about something? And uh, we were immediately super intrigued. And he was like, hey, do you, do you guys know who Lauren Bouchard is? And we were like, yes, of course, we're huge Bob's Burgers fans. And he was like, well, actually, we're going to, like, create this animated series together. Would you want to be involved? And I think at that point, I dropped the phone and started crying because that's literally, like, you know, like, you never think someone's going to call you up and be like, hey, do you want your dream job? Um, but that's what happened that day. Yeah, it was so nuts. That's and, fantastic. Um, yeah, it was really cool. So uh, then we were sort of like, okay, 
we have to sit down and write this huge opening number that we're going to put into this pitch that we're going to go out with. Um, and we have to A, make Josh happy that he asked us and B, somehow impress Lauren Bouchard enough to make, convince him that we deserve this job. And so that's when we sat down and wrote the song that's still the, the title song, Central in My Heart. Um, and yeah, I mean, whenever we sit down to write, we always just kind of try to make each other laugh. But we also knew we were writing for Josh, who is like this comedic savant, as is Lauren. So it was kind of easy, like just picturing him singing the song and, and getting to put uh, all the silliness that we know he has inside of him um, into this song. And we flew out to record it and it was such a cool day. And yeah, the rest is kind of history. So you write the song, you write all of that, like all the lyrics and I mean, I mean, do you have anything on the script to go with or you create? Because like in that opening song, there's all oh, that great stuff of like the guy peeing and all, you're going to all of those people like you're talking about. Do you just come up with that and then they follow your lead? Is that, how does that work? Every song's a little bit different, I would say. But in the case of that one, we had a little bit of a rough start, uh, not a rough start, but a rough idea to start with from Lauren and Nora Smith. Mm -hmm. um, they had sort of like pitched out some lyrics and like it would be sort of like this and we're talking about how like there's exercisers and it's an equalizer and and some of those things we actually pulled in and they're still in the song um, because they were just such smart lyrics. So that one was a little bit, that was semi-collaborative in terms of putting that one together and you know we really wanted to make it something that was true to what Lauren and Nora had already kind of dreamed up. Um, and then from there, I, we get a lot of um, song descriptions, like little beautiful word salads and you cool. know paragraphs that kind of break things down from the writers who are just so funny. The writers on Central Park are brilliant. So we have a lot to work with. It's like kind of being handed a gold mine and saying like, just, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a cool collab. I just, I love animation. Uh, I, I love the collaboration since you have time. That It's, it's neat to hear how all of that works. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I want to ask Tim uh, for Troll Hunters Tales of Arcadia. Uh, epic show on Netflix. Um, you have the honor of working with Guillermo del Toro. We worked together a lot on the, the pilots. There was a double pilot for, for Troll Hunters. He was there. And then he basically went off uh, to work on other things. And Rodrigo Blas, who was his sort of on, on in LA guy, um, he, he took over and uh, with uh, Christina Steinberg and Chad Hammers, the producers, we all sort of put the score together. And but Guillermo was always there. And on the big episodes, he would come back and direct. And that was always like, oh, you know, what's going to happen? But by the time he came back, we, we had everything dialed in. So it was always, it was always cool. And, and, any meeting I've ever had with Guillermo is very business-like to the, the project. It's like half an hour on whatever it is you're discussing. And then mm -hmm. after that, it's just talking and catching up. And then he disappears nice. and never responds to emails when I want to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's A lot of that going around. <laughs> yes. That's, that's the Hollywood that he had. Now, my next question is for everybody. Have any of you gotten a chance to use a unique sound, uh, an odd instrument, or musical Easter egg in one of your scores. Let's start with you, Roger. Yeah, it's a good question. I, you know, I do a lot of animation scoring. I also do a lot of just uh, yeah, feature film scoring as well. So um, every time I start a new project of any variety, I like to come up with, I'd like to buy myself a new instrument. It's like, you know, a friend of my film. <laughs> something that's appropriate to this to the score or not, you know. So um uh like I did a score recently that was both very early eighties sounding, this for a film Valley Girl. Not animated, good film though. Um and I bought a um this baritone electric guitar that they used in um the psychedelic furs, because I wanted that sound. So that was it. It's just my sister brought this frog back from Thailand for me and uh, it was just like sitting on my desk and uh, I was starting to work the, on the score for Powerless, which Alan was in and uh, was just like making noises on stuff and uh, you know, this is actually a Thai percussion instrument. 
probably seen this. Anyway, that sound is like all over the score of Powerless. Like almost every cue has some like either li literal this sound or some sort of, um, uh, you know, um, the deconstructed version of it. Weirdly, that sound just sort of worked for this goofy sitcom. It just sounded like a kind of sitcom-y sound or whatever. And the score it definitely like affected the other uh, instrument choices that I made for that show. Uh, Sebastian. Yeah, every series I've worked with, there's always an Easter egg drop. And I'm, I love hearing from fans when they heard, did you use on Transformers, like, the transforming sound in the beat for episode three? I'm like, I definitely did that. And that was for you. And they're like, I knew it! And um, I guess I'll throw out Turtles, too. Um, I guess Turtles, it was basically, uh, them thematically, I used things. I took things from different parts of, iterations of turtles and did pieces of themes. Um, so yeah, I'm always dropping Easter eggs. I'm an Easter egg dropper. <laughs> yeah, that, Tim, did you have a, an Easter egg that you- well, I was just gonna say in, in, uh, in Troll Hunters, I remember Guillermo telling me at the very beginning that the trolls were made of stone. So right. I thought, oh, let me, you know, sample some stones and rocks and, and I, the only, I could only find some like little stones and bricks in my uh, in my backyard so i got all excited and i'm in my my nice hardwood floored studio and i'm get there with the microphones and i get two bricks and i don't know if everyone's tried smashing two bricks together but it creates a hell of a high pitched noise and then the bricks just shatter everywhere mm -hmm. so it was a bit of a disaster the the brick sampling but the stones actually sounded really cool and uh I, I would use them anytime the, the trolls were fighting, the sort of the tick up mm. was the stones. Oh, cool. that, cool. And that sort of became, uh, I didn't get any emails from any fans. I'm not sure if I didn't have any fans or they didn't know my email or <laughs> no one noticed. Kate, Lisa, do y'all have anything? Yeah, well, this is a little bit less destructive than yours, Tim, <laughs> with the bricks. <laughs> but some uh, two really cool things about Central Park is um, one, are the main character, Birdie, that Josh Gad plays, he's a busker with his violin in Central Park. And right. I actually used to busk myself with my violin in Central Park. So anytime you hear in the score or in the songs, if you hear him playing violin, that's actually the same violin. It's, it's me on the same violin that I played in Central Park, which is really <laughs> special for me. And um, cool. Kate is an incredible singer. And so if you listen carefully, you can hear her doing bath ups. Um, you have to listen really, really, really carefully. <laughs> well, Cindy, Cindy Lauper was one of the guest artists for the second episode. And yeah. on one of Cindy Lauper's songs, Kate got to do this beautiful operatic voice um, mm. in, in the intro oh, cool. to the song. So that's Kate. Wow, yeah. It's cool, yeah. It's really, it's quiet, but it's, it's cool. It's cool that I can say that. <laughs> Raj. Now, we work together on J.J. Villard's Fairy Tales. What yeah, is. is your favorite scene that I was in that you <laughs> scored? <laughs> and why was it so wonderful? Um, J.J.'s a nut. You know, he's just like seriously disturbed a man um, who I love so much. Um, and he would do these crazy animation things where people would just be, characters would just be talking, and then their, like, the their internal organs would fly out of their ears and just and fill up the space and then recongeal into some other entity like some bunny and then change back to, uh, you know, to the original character, just like for no reason, just because he's um, disturbed. So, uh, you know, just have to find ways to make up, make that to happen musically. Um, you know, he's such a great writer. I hope you had to enjoy working with him as, well, as much as I do because his characters are so cool. And every time, I will tell you this, this is, for, this is true. Uh, he, every time a new episode would show up um, to me, I would say, who is that great, who are those great voice actors? Like the performances he, he got time and time and again were really wonderful, you know, really vivid. It's, 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 it's some of the greatest fun you could ever have because it's, it's like you, 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 you get in a booth and you get to do all these, you know, weird physical things because nobody's looking at you and you're not yeah. acting with anybody else. <laughs> and many times I, 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 I say to myself, you know, I'm, I'm getting paid to do this, you know. <laughs> I mean, 
No one's no one's looking, but no one knows how much fun I'm having by myself here. <laughs> Sebastian, um, uh, on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, you have hip hop throughout the entire series. Can you tell us about that? Well, I don't know. I guess uh, in terms of it being different, I, I don't really feel that it's different when you are comparing hip hop to orchestra music. I mean, I don't know. Like if you hear the Imperial March and Empire Strikes. Empire Strikes Back makes your head do this. That's basically the essence of hip hop right there. So as far as combining hip hop with orchestral music, there's not really a difference. As far as the choice to put hip hop all throughout TMNT, that came about where we hadn't seen the hip hop element. Like there's always been an underground element to the Ninja Turtles and there's never been that exploitation of the underground sound of hip hop. So they always have this underground punk sound or this kind of dark, um, I don't know, emo-y sound, but it's kind of a hodgepodge. I really wanted to also wedge in there. Hip hop is also underground too. So we put a little bit of elements of turntablism as well as just, you know, straight up hip hop to kind of give it a full, you know, rounded hip hop sound throughout. But it, you know, it doesn't skip on the, you know, on the orchestra elements either. I think it fits in really good. Nice. Um, uh, Jefferson, we both work on Harley Quinn, of course. Did you create any themes or is there any sound for my characters of Clayface or the Joker? I guess the similarity between them is that both of those characters are just super arch in different ways. And I know that's shocking to everybody uh, watching <laughs> this that Alan Tudyk has two arch characters, but. Um, you know, Joker is a clown and he's the Joker. And, you know, uh, so there's a lot of, the, that theme is inspired by uh, carnival-esque music, sort of dark carnival-esque music. And the way I came up with this theme was, the first theme that I wrote for the show was Harley's theme, obviously. It was like a cross between punk rock and, and carnival stuff. Um, and so I had a bunch of different keyboard and organ sounds for the carnival stuff and uh, like calliope and just like, uh, you know, a little uh, old ham and organ, anything that would make it sound sort of side showy or carnival-y. Um, and a pretty, uh, you know, straightforward up the middle um, carnival sound. But then for Joker, I took all those sounds and distressed them in different ways with like different, um, you know, um, effects and stuff to just kind of make it a little bit more evil and weird and dark. Mm. Uh, for Clayface, um, the, another thing that Alan and I share together is that uh, not only do we work on two shows together, but we both went to Juilliard. And I'm assuming <laughs> that Alan for, uh, well, Clayface, for those of you who haven't watched the show, it, uh, um, you know, thinks of himself as this master thespian. And, yes. uh, yeah, <laughs> and uh, that's sort of the gimmick with him is that uh, he he um, uh, he's got this like very very like formal acting training kind of sound, and I assume that Alan uh, used his time at Juilliard as a reference for that. Uh, and so I dusted off my old classical music chops and wrote like a very fancy baroque. Uh, you know, harpsichord theme for Clayface that is just sort of meant to accentuate the idea that, I don't know that Clayface is pompous exactly because I think he's got a good heart and always does things um, in other people's best interest. But, you know, like his, yeah, his, uh, his uh, ego is, is strong. <laughs> <laughs> We love that. <laughs> uh, this is for Tim. Now, aside from your role as the composer for Troll Hunters, you're one of the most in-demand orchestrators and conductors in Hollywood. Uh, for our audience members who are less music savvy, uh, and for me too, actually, can you uh, describe the differences between the positions? Basically, you know, the composer writes the music, gets through the whole process with the director, the stressful part, the, you know, the part where you don't know what you can do tomorrow because if your music's thrown out, you, you, you can't do anything but rewrite the whole episode. That part of the composer thing, that's sort of the bit that I don't enjoy. That's why I still 
orchestrate. And that's why I went down that path anyway, because I, I enjoy, you know, when I, as an orchestrator, the composer's been through all of that and they've written the music usually in their, their computer and then they send it to me to write the score and to sort out, you know, when they did eight revisions and just piled up seven orchestras worth of music now, uh, I go through and sort it back down to one orchestra and make it work. And uh, if they've written something impossible, I make it possible. I decide how we'll record it. Do we break it up? Do I just change it? You know, like I'm, you know, the orchestra is like my favorite instrument, the whole thing. Mm. So I can trick it into doing things. And I know when they, when something's really hard for them, I, I have a good sense of knowing that. And then I know how to make them do things. So I, I kind of, the composer does it all in the computer and then it comes to me and then I, I make the score and, you know, then go and conduct it. But uh, anyway, I, I do actually love, uh, you know, everything, anything to do with playing with music and musicians, uh, you, can, you can count me. And I do a lot of arranging for hip hop artists and, and that sort of stuff. And I have my big band. So I, I do a lot of things and I always wanted to be diverse. I think I should have been like around in the fifties or sixties when like Nelson Riddle and Neil Hefty and Quincy Jones and all of those guys, um, Owen Costell, you know, all these guys that could do everything. They would, one day they were in the studio uh, doing a TV episode and the next day they were working with Sinatra and then they were working on a, a musical, you know, and I, I just love waking up each day to something different and nothing repetitive. Well, one thing is for sure, uh, when you're a singer I'm, uh, I'm, uh, in, in front of an orchestra, there's nothing like having that support mm -hmm. and that, that sound behind you. That's like, it's like I died and gone to heaven. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, and I, I love that, like when you're the first person too. So like, I mean, recent example, Frozen 2, uh, I orchestrated and conducted that for, for Chris Beck and we played one and one the first cue and when we did frozen one it was just you know sort of like another day at the office no one knew what it was it was just this animated thing with with a lot of icicles everywhere and then it became this massive thing so going back for frozen two was like we knew we were doing something special and it was going to be uh you know really cool and so playing that first piece of music and seeing the title come up and you're the first person, you're, you're sort of closest to it, to hearing it. Mm -hmm. And then you're the first person as the conductor that gets to sort of mold it a little bit. I mean, ultimately it's Chris's baby, but you know, I do remember there when, when the, the choir started up and, and everything like the goosebumps, just thinking, wow, I mean, I'm in sort of a bit of history here. And uh, you know, so that's, that's what, you know, conducting gets, gets me into those situations where I remember first time we heard the Ant-Man theme when we recorded that. I mean, it's like, who would do a superhero theme with pizzicatos and you know, Chris did it and it worked. Yeah. So I love that part of the job. Fantastic. Uh, Alisa, Kate, you've been friends, friends for a really long time. Uh, uh, how did you begin your collaboration and do you have any advice for friends who want to work together in creative spaces? Yeah, we met well, we're coming up on our 10 year anniversary, actually, of being writing partners. We met 10 years ago in a wonderful writer's workshop in New York City called the BMI Layman Angle Writer's mm -hmm. Workshop. And so we were paired with each other the first day just by happenstance and totally <laughs> hit it off. And I think it was right. Love at first right. <laughs> and I think then it, at that point, it was very much like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if there were more female songwriters in the world? Let's do that. <laughs> and then we just committed to each other and have been writing ever since. Isn't yeah, that we sort of have like a, a philosophy and it would be my advice to anybody who works with a partner is, Find somebody who you genuinely think is a genius and work with them because if you both treat each other like geniuses, then your relationship is inherently built on trust and respect and admiration of each other. And you're never going to have a battle of egos or a clash of what you want to say. And, you know, it's just really helps to unite your vision and to, to be able to put out into the world something that 
you're both equally proud of, even if like one person had a, like 70% of one song and you were 30, or there's always going to be a check and balance in that way. And um, so you just can always, you, we like to think of it as like everything we write is us. It's Samson and Anderson. It's not more Kate or more Elisa. It's just, it comes from both of us. And um, yeah, and it's just, it's so fun to go through all of this as best friends too. It's been a blast. That's great. Continuing a brilliant tradition of you know, musical theater, Rogers and Hart. There's a lot of uh, great teams. Oh, yeah. As artists, oh, this is for everybody. Are there any causes or organizations that you are passionate about supporting? When I sort of started to get successful and, you know, have, have some money, I thought it was, it was time to, um, you know, give, give something back. And I, I knew a lot of other composers were involved with a group called Education Through Music mm. Los Angeles. I mean, there's a national part, but the Los Angeles part that I'm involved in. And so we uh, raise money to put music into disadvantaged schools in, in the Los Angeles area. So I joined the board of that. And that's my sort of little, little thing, thing that I do. I think it's, you know, it's really important that everyone that gets to our position has, has their little thing. Um, and so that, that's been mine and it's a great organization. And then I've roped in all the lots of other people that I've worked with to help out or join boards and, and all that sort of stuff. And uh, it's a really, really cool organization that does a lot of things. And, you know, I was lucky to go through uh, primary school or elementary school when the government provided music education for every kid. You could do whatever you wanted. You could pick any instrument you wanted. And uh, I picked drums just because it was on Tuesday and I wanted to get out of class. And, but that's how I started and became a musician. And, you know, but a lot of people now don't have that opportunity. So, it's important to, you know, give, give kids that opportunity and, you know, all the studies that show that, you know, people that do music, it improves lots of other things. And even if they don't go on to be a, a musician, it's a, it's a great thing. Like the, exactly. all of the board is full of lawyers and doctors and, and, and a few people like me, but most of them play violin still or piano still and, and all of that sort of stuff. So it, mm -hmm. definitely there's something, something to it all, but that's my little baby. That's a great, great organization thing, but thank you for supporting that. Yeah. My story, I think, is like you, where I um, received great music education in school. Uh, I started my career, and that education has not been available in those schools for decades now. So, I, you know, I, too, do, um, do teaching and do donations and do mentoring uh, for musicians because um, uh, I just receive so much great mentoring, uh, you know, throughout all of my formative years, and I feel like it's... Uh, it's just so important to give back to that, you know, because I'm here, I'm here, here we benefit or professionals, we have careers. Uh, I don't know how I go about it now because this, the resources aren't there if they are free, you know, it's not good mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to ask everyone uh, a question as well. Given the current events and the need for greater representation of diverse voices, what can the creative community in Hollywood do to support that? I'll jump in and just say, I think creating examples, um, taking a chance on someone with a more diverse voice and a more diverse background. And in doing that, you're creating an example for a younger artist to see themselves and believe that they too could have their voice represented in that way someday. Um, but we have to continue to allow that kind of growth in, in the representation. And then hopefully someday we'll have you know, a world where it's a vast array of voices and no one would ever think like, hey, I don't really have a place in that world. You know, I think the more somebody can see that, that they are represented, the more of a chance they will have in, in being able to have a place, I guess, in this industry. Well, let me ask a question about that representation issue to all, all of our panelists, because, um, you know, we, as composers, we're essentially independent contractors. We have choices in who we hire, so we can make choices there about, you know, um, how broadly we can um, choose to, um, to address representation. We also have choices in, in who we work for or work with, you know. Um, so, um, like in my case, I'm, I'm very, very proud and happy when I'm able to work with directors who are women, because that, that's an underrepresented area in Hollywood, which is being increasingly addressed, and I, and I enjoy that, but it's a... Um, 
you know, those are just some of the few areas which where I can where I personally have any power over representation right. in my case. How do how do you others others feel about that? Yeah, I don't know. Me, I guess in my personal experience, I really feel like growing up always wanting to do this job that I'm doing right now, but never seeing anyone besides maybe Quincy Jones do it. Mm -hmm. um, just seeing other people do it. I think you never know what's possible until you see it happen, you know? So I guess I grew up with a couple of examples, but, you know, um, if, you know, directors, people in the industry are willing to not just go with the next person that they know and have worked a hundred times with, but are actually exploring other people, I think the diversity will happen on its own. And I think there's a whole bunch of, I've never, I'm basically a unicorn as far as I know. Like I've seen a couple, but <laughs> it's kind of rare that there's other black composers, you know, but I know they're out there because I've met them. But as long as there's more representation of it out there, then we'll see that it's possible. And then maybe other kids be like, oh, I could do that too. I don't have to be, you know, put into a box of doing a type of music or a type of entertainment, you know, like that's also possible. Uh, tell a story about Harley Quinn, which is uh, the first two seasons of Harley Quinn. One of the major uh, plot lines is this will they, won't they between Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn. And uh, for some of the fan base, particularly younger LGBTQ audience members, uh, that is the most important storyline. And, um, and uh, at some point in the middle of season two, I, I started thinking about the whole show as an allegory for how hard it is for people to come out of the closet and uh, started writing the score that way. And then uh, uh, there's a big scene in the middle, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't watched it, they consummate their relationship with a big kiss, big, huge romantic kiss at the end of uh, an episode in the middle of the season and uh and it's the you know they kiss after they've uh been hanging from a vine in a pit in a prison and it's just like so you know metaphorical to how hard it it, it must be for some people to come out when the episode came out um it was uh, toward the beginning of the quarantine i was having like a really really terrible day as a, a lot of us have lately and and uh, that moment helped so many people. You know, I, I was on Twitter and there were like so many young lesbian girls who were like, that actually like made their lives a lot better that day. And it felt so good to be able to part, you know, be a part of that. Um, and so, I mean, in my personal life, I do activism, but I think that whenever you have the opportunity to um, help tell a story that, um, you know, makes things more diverse and makes life better for other people. I mean, that's why we're all doing what we're doing, right? You know, we're not just jesters. We're trying to, like, affect our audience members' lives positively. Amen. I think uh, if there's one thing that we as musicians do differently to a lot, and maybe we could uh, get everyone in the world to do it, is we do a lot with our ears, and not so much with our eyes. And I think if everyone could look with their ears uh, more, then, you know, the world would be just a, a better place because it takes a lot of, a lot of the things that we're talking about would be out of the equation. And I think in a lot of our lives, we, we, I, we, we go with what we hear and, and that it just, that what one, one little way to, you know, level some playing field, not the solution, but it's just something to think about for everyone. What advice do you have for aspiring composers and entertainment professionals? That's out to everyone. Uh, let, me, let me jump in, and this is also want to add to that question because I'm curious to get a response. How often do, are you guys hearing from young composers? Because I, they find me all the time. Like I'm on the phone once a week by somebody who has reached out, which is great. I super enjoy it. Um, is that the same for you all? Are you getting people who like just find you and ask you and ask you like, how do you, how do I get a start in the business? Yeah, yeah. I get yeah. emails every week mm -hmm. and try, try to respond to everyone. Sometimes I get a little, little behind and then I'll catch up and, and have a burst. But I, I definitely remember when I was starting out and calling people and emailing people and 
I remember the, the people that were really nice and the people, you know, people that took me to lunch and, uh, and then, you know, so now I try to, to, to do that when I, when I can, uh, I've got most of the people that work with me now, I sort of met that way. They either came up to me at a gig or, uh, or emailed me just randomly or followed me out of a, a lecture that I was doing a talk. Um, and then, you know, you, you, you connect some people hit you at the right time and there might be a little opening. Some people hit you at the wrong time and, and there's nothing, but definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. People reach out all the time and it, it's great to, to see who's around and, and chat to people. You know, people are always asking, uh, when they reach out, I think the main, the main question, no matter how they count it, it comes down to one thing. How do I get a gig? Um, how to make a career. That's two things. So, um, one thing I, that I, I think, Kate, you know, I'd like to hear you respond to this with your partnership. One thing I'd like to say, which is, I think it's true, is uh, you're going to get your break most likely not by somebody you're going to meet someday, but people you know now already. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're, even if you're not from Los Angeles, New York, wherever you are, it's people that you probably know, whether it's friends or relatives or someone within your social circle. It's, it's not necessarily about, um, I'm going to move to Hollywood and meet so-and-so famous director. Hopefully that happens um, at some point, but not, that's usually not how it starts. And, mm. and I think that's encouraging because, it, because the idea of trying to break into this business in, any, in any, any area, music or what have you, is so daunting, right? It's like, how do I do it? But um, mm. what I found from my own personal experience and just talking to people, this is true, is that you, the people that you know early on tend to be the people who support you and, we, and that continue to become important to you. The people you know, um, you know, ultimately often will be the people who end up either recommending you for a job or connecting you with someone. And it, it, it sort of is like this beautiful, yeah, branch in a way of, uh, of getting into the business. But you also have to have the, the work to show. And so when people ask me, for advice about that kind of thing, I'm always just like, create the content, create content, have it ready to go and ready to show off. If someone asks you to, sh for examples of your work, um, make sure you have that on hand and it's something you're proud of and it shows off who you are and your style and your, you know, your specific skill set. Um, and yeah, it's just really about having a wide variety and keep, you know, just keep keeping ongoing, persisting no matter what no matter the setbacks. Yeah. The way I put that is, um, uh, I mean, this job is a lottery. It just is, you know, like, and it's all about being in the right place at the right time. Uh, but uh, there's a corollary to that, which is you have to be in the right place at the right time with the right stuff. You know, if that opportunity presents itself to you that rare rare opportunity presents itself to you that you can actually start building a career out here you better already have the stuff of it like ready to go to take advantage of that opportunity as much as possible well everyone i think uh it looks like that's all the time we have today i want to say thank you to all of our panelists roger jefferson kate Elisa, sebastian and tim for being here with us today and for sharing their wonderful stories and expertise. Thank you guys. Thank you also to Impact 24 PR for putting this panel together and shout out to the amazing Comic-Con International team and to all of you for watching. Thank you. You can check out social media handles for cool panelists in the description below. Be sure to share your thoughts on social media using hashtag music for animation and tag us at Impact 24 PR exclamation point. I am Alan Tudyk. And I'm Keith David. Thank you all. It's been a pleasure. And see you all next time. Peace. Have a good con, y'all.